Penny, thanks so much for being with us. Happy um, to be here. I want to start by talking about this report, The Work Ahead, uh, which really mm -hmm. lays out the ways technology is changing the nature of work, but also the ways we're really unprepared as a society to deal with this. Um, and, and one of the things that we, we really do think about this as a, an economic issue, but in the report, um, you really lay it out as a, as a national security one, too. Uh, explain this for us. How is this really a national security issue? Well, all of us know that there are seismic forces that are affecting work today. Artificial intelligence, automation, globalization. This is not lost on any American. In fact, 75% of Americans will tell you they have real angst about not only their own future, but that of their children. So there's a real issue going on in America. It's actually going on all over the world as people recognize that we're being impacted by all the technology that we have. And the point of this report is to recognize our system is not prepared for the way work is changing. And we need to change our systems. Uh, and it calls for a cultural change, this embracing of lifelong learning and the fact that all of us are going to have to gain new skills over time. And that, in fact, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go back for a PhD or a master's degree. But we have to have systems that allow it and make it affordable, either within your workplace or elsewhere, to be able to gain new skills and that lifelong learning becomes something that's really real. Um, and the report is, is geared towards, and in the Council on Foreign Relations did this report, but with the real recognition that if we don't figure out how to help Americans have a pathway to prosperity and we don't better link education to jobs, that our economic security will be impacted, which will affect our national security. That's why they took it on. The report, though, is really a menu of options, and it talks about what can the federal government do, what can the uh, governors and big city mayors do, what can business leaders do, what can NGOs do, what should educators do. And so it's meant to be practical. Right. And it's the group that worked on it was completely nonpartisan, bipartisan, however you want to put it. It's not about anybody's you know, colors. This is about what should we be doing for the country. So I've heard you talk about it before as a do report. And so what, what are the things that we can actually change and take advantage of? And oh. Oh, I'm clicking or making noise or all, doing something. Sorry set. about that. No problem. Um, well, you know, first of all, one of the things that employers can do is make it much clearer what are the skills that you need from your workforce and make that much more transparent locally to your um, education system and to your local government system. Another thing that we can do is we need to help displaced workers in a different way. Right now we have this thing called trade adjustment assistance. So you have to prove that you lost your job due to trade and then we only help about 50,000 Americans a year who are, you know, have lost their jobs. So, so we need to change that. Modernizing benefits. So you know, everybody seems now to have you know, there are multiple things that they're working on. And how do we make sure that if you've got a portfolio of work, you're also accumulating benefits mm -hmm. that can health care benefits, retirement benefits, so the gig and others. Economy, or so if you're in the gig economy, we have what, over 50 million Americans in the gig economy today. How can I be uh, 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 accumulating benefits? For an employer, it's expensive to do training. Why, you know, the tax bill that we passed, we basically said if you're going to buy a, a machine, you get to expense it right away. Why not, if you are investing in your workforce, why can't you be able to expense that, get a greater credit on your taxes for that kind of investment? We really emphasize local solutions. So we give a whole portfolio of examples of what's working in different parts of the country as real examples of what's helping uh, improve uh, the skills uh, capability locally and what have governors done, what have mayors done. So this is, uh, we're big believers in, in this partnership between states or big city mayors, the business community, and the education. So could you give us uh, an example or two of a success story? What does this look like? Well, uh, take two different states. Take Delaware, for example. Governor Markell, 
who um, you know finished his terms two years ago, he basically took half of the high schools in um, in Delaware and basically said, you can go to community college for free and gain skills so that when you graduate from high school, you're capable of actually going into their manufacturing workforce. Or in, Del in Colorado has been really progressive, Governor Hickenlooper, who uh, remains governor today, um, has done a lot. He had to change 12 to 15 laws in the state to make it easier for a student to be able to access different certificates or skills in a way as you're going through high school or community college. And so we don't even, I don't think, I wasn't aware are there state laws that are impediments to a workforce or, or to an average person being able to access training. So this is the kind of thing that needs to be done. We also really focus on investing in R&D that we still, the United States needs to remain an economic leader. And we're spending less and less as a percentage of GDP on our on research and development in our country. And in fact, we're probably, we're the lowest spending as a percentage of GDP of any of the OED, OECD countries except Mexico and Chile. That's kind of nuts at a time when you guys are all innovating and creating new opportunities. We should, that should be a part of our spending. Um, one of the things that we really applaud is the leadership of businesses that have embraced their role in training. So for example, AT&T came to the conclusion, hey, we're letting people go and then we're hiring people over here. What if we invested in our existing workforce? And there's so many phenomenal stories of people who find themselves out of work but with a little bit of investment are absolutely terrific uh, contributors in other places. So a Walmart or a Starbucks, a AT&T, you know, and then you've got Aon and Accenture that are very much focused on apprenticeships and growing apprenticeships. So let's, I know apprenticeships, that's a big focus for you. Why is, has that just really not taken off in this country in a big way? There's no reason it shouldn't. Because if you actually look at, you know, and, and I'm, I will bet everybody in this room is struggling to find people with the skills they need. That, but how do we create a pipeline of apprenticeships? One is we need non-traditional companies to offer apprenticeships. So think of more white collar type jobs. So take, for example, Accenture, and I'll tell you the story of um, Andrew Skelnick, who is here in Chicago. And Andrew was an auto tech working in a warehouse. They were going to um, basically more further automate the warehouse. And he was going to, you know, on the bubble for his job. But they said, if you get training at your community college, you can um, be prepared for the tech job. Well, it turned out he went and got the training and then qualified for an Accenture apprenticeship in IT and now is a full-time employee at Accenture. That's the kind of thing that we need to be doing more of, is offering pathways from where you're at in a job that may be either going away or changing into, I'm a big believer, there is work in the future. We're not preparing our workforce for that. Um, and on the flip side, I also think what we're not doing is our immigration policy makes no sense also. Um, we're allowing basically Canada to thrive off of our need for, our U.S. company need for high-tech personnel. Tell us a little more about this. So Canada has been very forward um, thinking. What they did is they passed this um, Global Talent Stream initiative um, which gives quick visas to people with high-skilled talents that are needed. Um, they give tax incentives to companies that invest in R&D. They offer students from foreign countries that have come to the universities uh, permanent residency if you're in the high-tech fields. And they've seen a year-over-year 20% -year growth in foreign nationals in their universities. What's the net result of that? You've got Uber, you've got Salesforce, you've got Facebook, you've got... Um, uh, uh, Alphabet, uh, uh, all in making massive investments all over Canada that they would like to make here in the United States. They cannot get the folks into the country. And then we are now taking away the right for our H-1B visa 
uh, workers their spouses to work. Well, I don't know about, I don't know if you're married, but my spouse, if my spouse couldn't work, it makes it really tough on us as a couple. Um, and the net result is Toronto added 28,700 new tech jobs just last year, in the year over year. That's more than Silicon Valley, that's more than Boston, that's more than uh, DC, you know, and that's crazy. Those are jobs that have a huge multiplier effect in our communities. Because not everybody's gonna be a tech worker, right. but we need that kind of higher income earning as part of our communities. Right, right, I wanna hear from the room in a second, but first I just wanna ask you, you, know, you, when you were in your role as Secretary of Commerce, I know you talked to a lot of CEOs, I don't know, probably some of the people in this room, but what did they tell you? What were you hearing? And, and how much of your work now stems from some of those conversations? Well, the work stems from definitely some of those conversations, but also this has been an issue since 2009. It's just now more of a crisis because we have such high, such uh, low unemployment and such high needs in our businesses. Um, but, uh, you know, I talked to, as Secretary of Commerce, I don't know, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 CEOs. Probably many of you in the room, if I could see past these clique <laughs> lights that are you know, shining it's pretty bright, here. It's true. But um, basically, uh, everybody told me, whether they were a bicycle manufacturer or running a large Fortune 50 company, they could not find the workers they need with the skills they need. And so you know, the Department of Commerce is not the Department of Labor or the Department of Education. But we made it a priority because it deals with our competitiveness as a country, is access to a skilled workforce. We made that a priority in the Department of Commerce. And we had a whole skills for business initiative. And very much folks in, you know, all over the country were really uh, excited by that. Great. Do we have any questions for Penny from the audience here? This is hard to see. It's not a shy crowd. <laughs> well, let me, let me first ask you then, you know, you're back in the private sector. How have you really thought, taken these, own, these lessons about reskilling and applied them to yourself? How, how are you really thinking about lifelong learning as you engage in this new part of your career? So, you know, everybody talks about I was Secretary of Commerce, but basically most of my career has been in the business sector. I spent, you know, 25 plus years prior to being Secretary of Commerce and have been back in the private sector. So one of the things we're doing is investing in these areas because, frankly, we see there's a need and an opportunity. So whether it's in a company called Piazza that basically has created, uh, using a uh, network they've created among high-skilled uh, uh, students in colleges um, around the country, and using that as a source of, uh, of future employees to probably many of the companies in this room. Uh, so we're using, we're basically seeing this as a huge trend that's not going away, and we're trying to not only work in our communities, I work with Skills for Chicagoland's Future, which acts as an intermediary to take folks from our various South Side and West Side communities and help them into uh, employment from their current situation and onto a track, like I told you about the story of the gentleman from uh, uh, Accenture. Um, so it's part of my commitment to our city. It's part of our investing strategy. Uh, we're doing a lot of different types of HR tech investing. Uh, and we think that's a, a robust place, among other things that we do in right. business services, industrials, um, uh, and other areas. Terrific. I think we do have a question up here. Hi, uh, Dan Michaud with Arup. Uh, a moment ago you mentioned the dearth of well-trained employees that you kept hearing from all these companies. A few years ago uh, there were the scandals of the private colleges uh, creating grads that were unemployable. Seems like there's a huge gap there. What's missing? Well, I think one of the things that's important, I, I actually am agnostic whether the training is provided by a for-profit or non-profit, but what's important is that actually if I'm the person taking a set of courses to get a credential, it's actually valued by you guys. 
and it's worth something. What we can't do is have somebody who takes their either their hard-earned money or the Pell Grants and spends it on something that doesn't deliver. And that was part of the challenge that existed with some of the for-profit providers, is you, weren't, you were seeing folks not getting employed and not getting value for the training that they had done. That's where it's really important that there's a partnership between the education providers and the private sector. What are the skills we need? And that the IP that we're training folks with is valued. Right over here. Thank you. Uh, Evan Kraus from APCO, um, thank you for being here. Uh, we've had a lot of sessions over the last um, day or so about new technologies and adoption of new technologies within companies. And every once in a while, um, uprears the ugly head of the specter of regulation around things like AI and privacy and fairness and access and all kinds of things. Um, and in, in most cases, um, the, the authentic answer is that government doesn't quite know how to regulate these things quite yet. Um, but there's immense commercial pressures for businesses to embrace these technologies. So as, a, as someone who sat in the seat, um, what advice do you give us on the business community side about what we should be doing to um, to make these decisions so that we're not um, investing in, in technologies and in solutions that are going to be um, raise regulatory problems down the road. Okay, this is one woman's point of view, so I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I think a couple of things. First of all, I think as you develop new technologies, to have them be born secure. Um, you know, cybersecurity being a huge issue, and, and frankly, we were not developing technologies originally worrying about that, but today we've got to do that. The second is around the issue, you know, the very sensitive issue around privacy, because we have some businesses whose models, demand, you know, are built upon taking our data and using it, and we have others who are not. And that's one of the why you can't get a unified tech opinion as to what to do about privacy. But I think what's happening is while we're busy um, struggling to figure this out, you see what's happening in California, you see what's happening in Europe. I think what's gonna happen, this is my prediction, is you're going to end up with the world with a different set of privacy rules in different parts of the world. That is not good for the tech companies at all. And that's something that they were, they at the time I was secretary, that wasn't yet on their radar screen. We tried to get a privacy bill of rights, you know, to get be adopted um, under the Obama administration, and because of the, you know, differing perspectives of the most the biggest companies, it was it was not it was not doable, and yet I think today we would love for some kind of uh, set of safe harbor rules or bill of rights because it would make life easier. Instead, you're having to comply with GDPR, we're gonna to have to comply with California. I'm certain there's a different set of rules that are gonna be created in China. My guess is India will have their own, and pretty soon you're gonna look a lot like it's a mosaic as opposed to what the internet was supposed to be, which is information could flow freely. Uh, and so this becomes a real challenge, I think, by not coming to a, you know, e even a consensus about where we ought to go around privacy. Great. Penny, thank you so much for your work on the work ahead. Great to have you here with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.